Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bethan Jones, and I will be your MC for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us at the Tokyo London Financial Seminar 2023. Today's program includes keynote speeches, discussions, and a networking session at the end of the seminar, which we very much hope you'll be able to join us for. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping points. Our speakers will be speaking in English, but if you would prefer to listen in Japanese, please follow the on-screen instructions. English is on channel one, and Japanese is on channel two. Please set your phone to silent, and note that filming, photography, and recording are restricted to staff and press only. Thank you for your cooperation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome Alderman Nicholas Lyons, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor of the City of London, and Her Excellency Yuriko Koike, the Governor of Tokyo. Do please sit down. Thank you. Governor, ladies and gentlemen, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you all this morning to Mansion House and to the London Tokyo Financial Seminar. And I'm especially pleased to welcome you, Governor Koyoki. I would like to thank you and all your team from Tokyo Metropolitan Government for being with us here today. I know uh, that you have had a very strong relationship with some of my mayoral forebears. Uh, and I thought our first bilateral meeting, which took place yesterday, was very productive. As an international ambassador for the UK's financial and professional services, about a third of my year is occupied with promoting this sector around the world. A highlight of any Lord Mayor's year is a visit to Japan, especially to Tokyo. And even though Tokyo has come to London today, I look forward very much to my visit later this year. But why is this visit so important? Well, for a start, our two countries share a long-standing friendly relationship. Indeed, if you'll permit me, I'll quote from a speech your Prime Minister gave at our historic Guildhall. He spoke eloquently about the relationship between our countries, saying that we, and this is a quote, we share universal values such as freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And I believe he's absolutely right. At the end of last year, the UK uh, government agreed a new digital partnership with Japan to aid collaboration on infrastructure and technologies. And just two weeks ago, the UK Prime Minister chose the Tower of London to be the site of an historic defense agreement co-signed by the Japanese Prime Minister, allowing UK forces to be deployed to Japan. Infrastructure and security are two of the most complex issues that societies are facing now. And the UK has a great ally in Japan in both these two endeavors. However, our business relationship also plays an important role in our unique partnership. Now, you will think I am biased if I said that our financial and professional services sector is one of our strongest trading links, but it is, in fact, absolutely true. In terms of trade in services, 
our financial and professional services sector dominate our trading relationship. In the middle of last year, financial services were the top export from the UK to Japan, accounting for 35% of all services exported, with insurance and pensions making up another 7%. These are huge trading export figures, amounting to two and a half billion pounds, which works out at about 19 pounds per person in Japan. And when it comes to imports, both these sectors made up over 10% of our service imports from Japan. And this is a remarkable achievement and one which I'm sure we will be discussing throughout today's seminar. If the UK's and Japan's relationship is close, then Tokyo and London's relationship is even closer. Indeed, our two cities share significant similarities. We both have sites of worship that have stood for hundreds of years. We both have world-renowned cultural institutions. And importantly for today's discussion, we both have a financial services sector that is dedicated to innovation. The Memorandum of Understanding between the City of London Corporation and Tokyo's Metropolitan Government is at the foundation of this close relationship. Right at the heart of the MOU, signed in 2017, is Tokyo's goal to revitalize itself as a global financial center. And today, we're going to be discussing how our two financial centers can work even closer together to achieve this aim. But before I hand over to Governor Koyuki, I think there's two aspects of our financial services trade which will be vital in making our ambitions a reality. The first is asset management, an industry in which we are great collaborators. Many large Japanese investors invest in the UK because the UK is a world leader in this arena. We account for 15% of global assets under management, managing 11 trillion pounds of assets. That's three times the GDP of Germany. Through our Global Investment Futures campaign, I have been championing the UK's asset management sector, and I believe there's a great opportunity for us to build on our relationship for our mutual benefit. And the second aspect of our special relationship that I want to mention is FinTech. Thanks to robust but agile regulation, the UK is one of the international centers for digital financial innovations. In fact, the UK is home to more than 100 tech unicorns. That's more than the rest of Europe combined. I believe that innovation in all forms will be a crucial part of the Tokyo Fin City, a global financial center at the heart of Japan. And I think we have a great opportunity ahead of us today to discuss how we can work together to make that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, when I became Lord Mayor in November, a business guest who attended what is called an installation dinner sent me a thank you card. And she included within the card a haiku, one which she said expressed the valued relationship between London and Tokyo. The haiku reads, Haru no mon, tomoni kugureba, hana sakuru. Forgive me if my pronunciation is far from perfect, but she assures me it translates as we go through the archway together and the cherry trees blossom. I believe it is a fitting poem for this occasion because if we work together today on our financial partnership, we will continue to see our friendship blossom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Next, Ms. Yuriko Koike, Governor of Tokyo, speaking in her role as conference organizer, will deliver her greeting 
and keynote speech. Governor Koike, the stage is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to first thank you very much for Honorable Law Mayor um, Nicholas Lyons for preparing such a nice seminar at the heart of the uh, City of London and at Mansion House. Thank you very much for receiving me and receiving uh, the, our group. And I actually, I prepared a thick a coat and umbrella, but fortunately, this time the weather is so wonderful. And thanks, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor, for arranging such a nice weather as well. And once again, good morning, everyone. It's 9:30 in in London GMT, uh, London um, Greenwich Mean Time, and uh, in Tokyo. It, what time is it now? It's about eight. No. Well, anyway, <laughs> I should say good evening to those of you viewing this online from Japan. I'm Koike Yuriko, Governor of Tokyo, and thank you very much for taking the time to come to the Tokyo London Financial Seminar. Lord Mayor, your kind cooperation for today's seminar is deeply appreciated. And it is a great honor to be able to co-host this with the City of London. And I would, like, I would also like to thank the Financial Services Agency Japan. Tokyo is a very appealing destination to build your businesses. Japan has the world's third largest economy, as you know and household financial assets amounting to over 13 trillion pounds. Now, focusing on Tokyo, with 14 million residents, our city is home to about 10% of, of Japan's total population. We also have a huge economy. Our gross product accounts for 20% of the GDP. And we gather companies that rank among the world's top 500 companies by sales. With our mature urban infrastructure, commitment to the rule of law, and stable social order, I can say with confidence that Tokyo presents the best stage for growth of the financial sector. And I hope that today's seminar will deepen your understanding of Tokyo, a city that continues to boldly take on challenges to regain or revitalize its position as a global financial center. In fall 2021, last year, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government released the Global Financial City Tokyo Vision 2.0 which has three pillars, green, digital, and players, or GDP. And we are accelerating initiatives to become a hub for international finance. The world is now confronting the climate crisis, energy crisis, and other difficult challenges. Tokyo aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by the year 2030, and an initiative we call Carbon Hub. In order to make buildings zero emissions, we have also enacted an ordinance that makes it mandatory for new homes and other relevant buildings to install solar panels. We will fully mobilize our policies to take on challenges. Finance is the key to overcoming crisis and achieving sustainable growth. Tokyo has placed the Tokyo Green Finance Initiative, TGFI, as central 
to the new vision with the aim to become Asia's leading green, hub, green finance market. And it is crucial to create a flow of funds to be utilized in efforts to solve environmental and social problems. In the fiscal 2017 budget, the first budget I compiled for after taking office as governor, about 130 million pounds worth of green bonds were issued for the first time. Tokyo received the second party opinion to ensure the transparency and alignment of the bonds, uh, of the bonds with international principles. Next fiscal year, we will issue green bonds and social bonds totaling some 630 million pounds for a cumulative total issuance issuance of about 2.4 mil four billion pounds in ESG bonds. The market is steadily expanding. Combined with the issuance of ESG bonds by local governments following Turkey's lead, the cumulative amount of public, publicly offered ESG bonds issued throughout Japan exceeded 68 billion pounds. To date, Tokyo has supported more than 50 private sector green bond issues. Meanwhile, the recent surge in energy prices and the situation in Ukraine have renewed awareness on the importance of transition to carbon neutrality. For this reason, we will expand the scope of our support to include transition bonds to ensure the green transformation trend. Public and private partnership funds are an effective means to efficiently direct private capital towards sustainable finance. We will establish a new fund that invests primarily in storage, ba uh, storage batteries in tandem with a fund already established to invest in already in, uh, uh, in tandem with a fund already established to invest in renewable energy facilities this fund will aim to realize carbon neutrality and energy security greening the entire supply chain is also vital we will support the efforts of small and medium-sized enterprises, which make up 90% of the companies in Tokyo. The Tokyo government, in cooperation with financial institutions, will promote the use of sustainability-linked loans. We will also launch a project to support SMEs in creating carbon credits and emissions trading. FinTech is the driving force behind digital transformation, the development of inno innovative services by FinTech companies will have significant positive impacts on our economy and society. TMG provides a wide range of support for FinTech companies, including investment through funds and subsidies for the development of new services. And there's Web3, which is attracting attention as a new world view. Taking in the global trend, we will boost, boost the digitalization of finance by supporting the issuance of digital securities using blockchain-based technologies. Startups are powerful creators of innovation. Last November, the Tokyo government released a new startup strategy, Global Innovation with Startups. This position Startups, uh, this positions startups as important partners for realizing the future. As a vision for innovation that will shape the future, 
A major rollout of the strategy is underway to realize the five-year goals of 10 times more global unicorns, 10 times more startups, and 10 times more public-private collaboration. As a part of this effort, we will attract funds and expertise from leading overseas venture capitalists and accelerators and connect them to startups to strongly support their growth. In addition, under the umbrella concept of Sushi Tech Tokyo, sounds delicious, which is short for Sustainable High City Tech Tokyo, the Tokyo government will utilize high technology to create sustainable new value. As the first phase of this project, City Tech Tokyo, an event that will gather cities, companies, investors, and other players from Japan and around the world, will be held this month on the 27th and 28th. So please save your time. <laughs> to attend this and enjoy. And oh, this is the, the invitation sushi. And if you are interested to get in, please let me know. <laughs> in the collaboration with startups, we will inform the world of ideas and technologies, the world of I ideas and technologies that will lead to a new vision for sustainable cities. Uh, this event can be viewed online. I look forward to your participation. And please do come to Tokyo as well. And concentration of diverse financial players will create synergy. I sincerely hope that you will consider expanding your business to Tokyo. We offer a full, full range of support services. For example, we have established an Access to Tokyo consultation desk in the Square Mile. In cooperation with the national government, we are enhancing our support for license acquisition and are preparing English language manuals. We are also implementing various initiatives for strong support. These include providing seamless assistance from setting up a base to getting established and priority support for green-related companies. I reached an agreement with the Lord Mayor yesterday on a framework for encouraging UK companies to develop their business in Tokyo. This will include fully utilizing the city's network and exchange information in more, do in more detail. I hope you will seriously think about expanding your business in our city. And I would like to conclude my talk today by wishing even deeper cooperation between the city of London and Tokyo and for our two cities to continue evolving. And thank you very much for your kind attention. So this is the sushi invitation. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Arigato gozaimashita. Governor Koike, thank you very much. Let's move now to our next speaker, Mr. Paul Madden, former British ambassador to Japan. Mr. Madden, stage is yours. Well, I'm glad that the governor left the Oishi Sushi on the platform. Uh, Lord Mayor, Governor Koike, thank you very much for inviting me to join this excellent event today. I should say from the outset that I am not speaking for the UK government. I'm now a private sector consultant and business advisor. But I'm pleased to engage with some of the initiatives that I worked on closely during my time as ambassador in Tokyo such as financial services cooperation. In fact, I was back in Japan three times last year and I'll be there again next month. Governor Koike, welcome back to London. 
Thank you for your leadership on coronavirus, which kept the residents of Tokyo, including me, safe. And also congratulations on hosting a very memorable Olympics and Paralympics in challenging times. I well remember the signing of the MOU between the City of London Corporation and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government in December 2017. It was a hybrid event. In fact, we got used to doing a lot of those during the course of COVID. But Governor Koike was at the embassy in Tokyo and the then Lord Mayor, Charles Bowman, participated by video. And I think that in the four years since then, we have seen real progress. And this comes in the context of a continued deepening of the bilateral ties between our two countries. The British government announced an Indo-Pacific tilt in its integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy in 2021. Sometime before that, the USA had announced an Asian pivot. Now, I could try to explain the difference between a tilt and a pivot, but I think I'd just end up sounding like a judge on Strictly. Well, Japan is a key partner in our Indo-Pacific tilt. As we saw, and as the Lord Mayor mentioned, when Prime Minister Kishida visited the UK just last month, he signed a very significant new defence treaty with Prime Minister Sunak, and that came hot on the heels of a December announcement that Japan would participate alongside the UK and Italy in the development and production of a major new fighter aircraft programme. And no doubt Rishi Sunak will be heading off to Japan in May to attend the G7 summit in Hiroshima. I was personally very involved with the negotiation of the UK-Japan Trade Agreement, or SEPA, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, the UK's first significant new trade deal post-Brexit. And in several areas, it went further than the previous EU-Japan agreement, particularly in financial services. The SEPA makes the process of applying for a license to operate financial services more transparent ensures that they are processed in a reasonable period of time and that the applicant is able to provide extra information during the process to complete their application. The SEPA also included additional safeguards on the ability to use, store and process financial data on a cross-border basis and data localization requirements were expressly prohibited. The SEPA also established a new annual financial services dialogue aimed at strengthening cooperation, reducing the risk of market fragmentation and expanding financial services trade and investment. This new financial regulatory forum met in June last year in London. Its remit includes provisions on information exchange, consultation, deference, technical mediation and cooperation on issues like diversity in finance and sustainable finance. I understand it was a very good meeting involving regulators and ministry officials from each side. Financial services was an area that kept me and my team at the embassy busy and that's hardly surprising given the importance of financial services to the UK economy. This focus has continued under my successor as ambassador, Julia Longbottom, and the embassy will be welcoming an asset management mission to Japan next month. In recent times, priority areas for UK-Japan cooperation within financial services have included asset management, green finance, and fintech. Japan represents a big opportunity for cooperation on asset management. Savers in Japan, who have historically been rather conservative, are looking for more attractive returns on their savings from more innovative investment products. And the UK, as the Lord Mayor said, has very long-standing strengths and significant players in this field. On green finance or sustainable finance, the two countries' positions are now much closer. The UK has been leading action to tackle climate change for some time. 
Japan was a bit slower with its emissions targets, but has now made significant advances and is committed to net zero by 2050. And I should record that this is an area where Governor Koike has been very much a thought leader in Japan. For business, it is very important to get agreements on consistency and clarity of measurements of standards and targets. The UK and Japan have now established a working group specifically looking at sustainable finance. Fintech has been another big strength for the UK, thanks to the combination of the global financial hub of the city and the innovation coming out of our great universities. We normally say that the Japanese market requires persistence and sustained commitment, and that is true, but occasionally we saw some incredibly innovative fintech companies coming out on one of our trade missions and walking away with customers or investors from their very first visit. Recent events in international affairs have presented multiple challenges to business. COVID had a massive recessionary impact, stopped much international travel, and left huge pressure on government budgets. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has led to unprecedented levels of international cooperation on imposing financial and other sanctions on Russia. It has also contributed to the return of inflation and the interest rate rises that have been introduced to respond to that and Chinese restrictions on democratic freedoms in Hong Kong have seen a significant outflow of people and investment to other financial centers, as I saw when I was in Singapore a couple of months ago. The growth and continuing success of specific financial hubs cannot be guaranteed. No one can rest on their laurels. They have to remain competitive. And that's why the Chancellor of the Exchequer Incidentally, the first Chancellor of the Exchequer to be able to give a speech in Japanese. That's why he set out an ambitious set of proposals in the Edinburgh reforms. Building and maintaining a global financial services hub depends on a range of players. The companies whose professionalism and dynamism drive the business. The regulators who provide confidence in the working of the markets whilst enabling innovation the local authorities who create the welcoming environment that makes international institutions and their employees choose to come and to stay. The national governments who have to get things like the tax and immigration policies right. And financial hubs need to develop strong links with each other. I think a lot of this is now happening at increasing pace between the UK and Japan, and I look forward to continuing success in the development of the London-Tokyo Financial Services Cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Madden. Next, Mr. Hideki Takada. Director of the Strategy Development Division of the Financial Services Agency of Japan will give his speech, Mr. Tagada. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Alderman Lyons, uh, Lord Mayor, and Gabada Koike-san, and Mr. Madden, uh, former British Ambassador to Japan, and distinguished guests. It is my great honor uh, to be here uh, at the Mansion House. I lived in the UK for five years in total, two years study and also three years second to HM Treasury, which is the British Finance Ministry. So the UK is like uh, a second home country to me, and uh, it is my great pleasure to speak for the collaboration between Japan and the UK. Now I am going to talk about uh, the International Financial Center Initiative of the Japanese government. As uh, Lord Mayor mentioned, uh, our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Kishida, made a speech in May last year in London. He made it clear that uh, the International Financial Center Initiative is a top priority of the Japanese government. And indeed, it is uh, an important pillar of his flagship policy 
the new form of capitalism. Sorry. The UK, uh, as you know, is a country with a long history. It is an old country, but it is not an uh, outdated country. So it is uh, continuously evolving, uh, and uh, it has uh, a certain uh, distinct attraction. Uh, it is outstanding uh, among the uh, Western countries. So is Japan. Japan has many advantages as an international financial center in Asia, where uh, there are uncertainties uh, uh, in the part of uh, the region. We have solid democracy and the rule of law. Japan is an attractive place for living uh, and also doing businesses. We have a large economy and market which continues to evolve around the themes such as uh, the fintech uh, and also sustainable finance. The assets managed in Japan are increasing and also there are significant asset owners such as GPIF, uh, the world's largest pension fund in Japan. And here is uh, a huge uh, untapped opportunities. So Japanese households have more than uh, 2,000 trillion yen of financial assets, but more than half of them were held uh, in cash and deposits. So there are huge untapped opportunities there. The Japanese government set out uh, the asset doubling uh, uh, plan uh, last November to mobilize these household uh, assets into investment. Okay, you may, you might think that uh, yes, Japan is a big country, a big market, but uh, it is not easy to do businesses in Japan. That is not true. So the Japanese government is now taking forward the International Financial Center initiatives. This is a government-wide uh, policy package that includes removing barriers such as tax and also uh, immigration control. So there are uh, now uh, uh, favorable uh, uh, immigration treatment and also uh, tax regimes for foreign asset managers. And also we established uh, the financial market entry office. Uh, it is a kind of uh, a satellite office of uh, the FSA, which is situated uh, in uh, the capital uh, very close to the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And uh, it was established in 2021, and uh, it provides uh, one-stop administrative services, all in English. Sorry. Since the Financial Market Entry Office was uh, opened in 2021, in just about two years, uh, the 15 legislation of uh, financial firms have been completed all in English. There is a dedicated uh, FSA webpage for, and uh, also LinkedIn for International Financial Center initiatives. Of course, all information is available in English. So please have a look. Now let me uh, move on to uh, our initiati initiatives to foster uh, innovative financial services or fintech. We have three pillars of uh, initiatives. The first pillar is that we provide support for firms and financial institutions uh, who want to start uh, innovative financial services. I will talk about it uh, uh, in more detail later. And second, we are creating a regulatory space which deals with new assets such as uh, crypto assets, uh, stable coins, uh, security tokens, etc. This is aimed at uh, promoting innovative uh, financial services and at the same time protecting consumers. And uh, we are setting a level playing field with other jurisdictions. Third, uh, we conduct extensive research into these new areas. We do all this uh, in cross dialogues with key stakeholders. We opened the uh, FinTech support desk in 2015. Anyone can consult with us about applicability of uh, regulation to innovative businesses. We give the answer in one day, in just one day, for 45% of cases consulted and uh, within a week for 78% of the cases. 
Also, we opened the uh, FinTech uh, Proof of Concept Hub in 2017. Here, you can try demonstrations of uh, unprecedented innovative businesses. We, cre we create uh, a dedicated team to support you. We convene FinTech meetup events to connect overseas FinTech companies with Japanese financial institutions. We do this with many countries, including the UK, of course. And uh, finally, uh, we are hosting an uh, annual uh, event, uh, which is called uh, the uh, FinSum, or the uh, FinTech Summit. The next summit takes place uh, on uh, 28 to 30 March. So this time, uh, it is held uh, in hybrid format, uh, both uh, online and uh, physically in Tokyo. So, please visit us online, or even better, come to Tokyo. And finally, uh, let me talk about uh, the uh, sustainable finance. So, as you know, and uh, as uh, uh, Governor Koike mentioned, uh, uh, Tokyo and Japan is also the hub for the sustainable finance. ESG investment is growing rapidly worldwide, but uh, the growth is particularly rapid uh, in Japan. The we, the FSA, are taking forward many initiatives on sustainable finance. So I don't have uh, time today uh, to talk about uh, them in detail, but I know that uh, the UK is also very uh, keen on sustainable finance. So please do visit uh, our uh, website uh, if you want to know more detail. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, to uh, further opportunities to discuss these issues with you more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Takada. In a few moments, we will move on to our fireside chat. Uh, please feel free to relax for a moment while the stage is prepared, and we will be back very shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We will now continue with the fireside chat, where today's theme is fintech. Please welcome to the stage our guests, Luke Waddington, CEO and co-founder of Blue Fire AI, and Gillian Painter, head of membership and engine at the Investment Association. Mr. Waddington, Ms. Painter, over to you. Well, thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting on the Mayor and uh, the Governor of Tokyo, and indeed all today's 
invited to be here today um, talking about the future of innovation in investment management. The Investment Association have thoroughly enjoyed speaking at these seminars over the last couple of years and we're delighted and very grateful for this opportunity to speak again. Joining me today are one of our most successful fintechs in the UK, Bluefire AI. A warm welcome to Luke Waddington, CEO and co-founder. The Investment Association has a very unique approach to innovation with our Accelerator and, Shalu and Solutions Hub. IA Engine, and I'm very proud to be part of this important initiative. Our mission has and always will be to fuel the adoption of technology within investment management for the benefit and changing needs of our clients. But it is our national and importantly our international networks that set us apart. And we're delighted to be partnering with 10 truly global financial sectors. Japan and our partnerships with JIAM and Finolab are very much at the core of this global program. And it's been fantastic to assist JIAM with the Invest Tokyo program and hear one of our latest cohorts, SESAM, working with FinCity Tokyo and Tokyo Metropolitan Government to expand their operations. But our global program is not just about signing MOUs, but about assessing and engaging with the best tech, innovation and initiatives emanating from these regions. It's our relationships that are so important for sharing best practice and accelerating growth. The last couple of years have certainly been interesting uh, from, a, from a global economic perspective with the numerous challenges and obstacles. But the UK remains one of the largest and most diverse centres of investment management in the world, second only to the US. And over the last five years, buy-side investment into technology development has genuinely increased. There's also a general agreement that consistent investment in technology is required to both remediate legacy infrastructure and maintain a competitive advantage. And we're proud that the UK is seen globally as a country of entrepreneurs, innovators and implementers, building strong relationships with these global markets. Global total capital investment into fintech was in excess of $102 billion in 2021. That's a 183% increase from 2022. And an impressive 2,500 fintechs have made the UK their home with a growing number, seeing investment management as an opportunity to redefine existing processes and business models, benefiting from access to the global markets, global talent and global connectivity. But that's a bit enough of the overview. Um, I'm very um, uh, keen to welcome Luke and thank you for joining me today. Bluefire is a successful growing fintech within capital markets and is an example of diversification not only of solution but of region. The UK and Japan have exceptional expertise in innovation. But the question is how can we best bring them together for the benefits of clients in both markets? So firstly, Luke, I would like uh, to better understand your perception of the UK as a key market, as an enabler for fintech, and secondly, what do you see as the appetite and opportunity for Japanese investment and growth? Um, yeah, so, so thank you very much for, for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'll be very transparent. I'm quite biased. Um, I spent half of my life in Japan and I spent half of my life in the UK. Um, so I sort of see things from, from, from a couple of angles. I think also with all the MOUs and all the policy that's been decided and all the support, we're the sort of small guys, girls on the street who actually go and try and implement that, get the compass, get the backpack and try and navigate through this to try and create success between those, those policies uh, and MOUs that are put in place. So when I step back and I, and I look at this, I see two parts. I see uh, UK and I see the fintech community in the UK where we have um, an unrivaled amount of companies doing some really cool things building some really innovative technologies. So the breadth of companies is, is, is amazing. We have the funding structures um, in terms of the VC, uh, private equity, and the funding structures as well uh, to support that. But I think more importantly, we 
have a very um, uh, energized client base in terms of when we talked about asset management, there's a real uh, investment banks in the financial sector, a real sort of need for change and want for change. So one of the things that highlights the, uh, the, the city and the London sector is the ability to move quite quickly there. So to do things like proof of concepts, uh, to try and fail, to try and succeed and then integrate, and that speed is, is um, real quality in just trying to actually get things done, uh, which then sort of feed up into all of the structures that are available. If I take the second half and then I look at Japan, Japan for me always blows my mind because the precision technologies and invents that don't exist in the world today are amazing. Um, and I think they're applied and they are put into a lot of the domestic market. Um, and what I see is a huge opportunity for that to express itself more internationally. Um, and any sort of structures that can get some of that technology into the ecosystem here, um, I think will be hugely valuable. So when I look at things like natural language processing technologies, some of the AI decision-making technologies, Japan actually leads the world. Um, it needs to express itself into, into uh, markets like this more as well. And, and I see those two things. I think what I'd like to do as a company as well is get into Japan. I'd like to see a bit more of the speed in terms of proof of concept, speed up that sort of decision-making to just have a go. I think if we can balance those two things between the UK companies like ourselves going in and trying to have a go and get things working, and some of that high-tech Japanese technology expressing itself in the London markets, the collaboration will be rivaled. Thank you, Luke. And you know, when you're thinking about Blue Fair Art, Blue Far AI, and your solution specifically, how do you how do you perceive the benefits of technology in reducing risk for the asset management uh, sector as a whole? So, so this is a really dangerous question because as all founders do, if you pull our string at the back, we just don't stop talking about it. So I'll try and not make this a, a monologue on blue fire AI. Um, the, key, the key advantage of technology our um, specific domain is to, is to reduce the cost. Sorry. Um, so so the, 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 the unit cost at the moment of analysing companies, so in the asset management space, uh, allocating capital is fully um, uh, using human capital. And that is extremely expensive. And we're just going into an economic cycle, which is now full of risk and very full of idiosyncratic risk on specific companies. So that's going to take more people. So when we want to sort of look at innovation in the asset management world, what Bluefire AI is doing is specifically trying to reduce that unit cost by introducing technologies that understand companies to a degree that can then work with humans in terms of making better decisions. And I think if we look at the world today, the unit cost of allocating capital is just very, very expensive. And so technologies can start to reduce and make those things more efficient. I think that's where we fit into the things that have been spoken today, so especially at the heart of this, if it's asset management innovation, we can really, and they are allocators of capital, we are a conduit to make that a cheaper um, point of um, use of technology. Thank you, Luke. And um, perhaps more topically, uh, what do you see as the impact of advanced AI solutions? I'm talking about chat GBT and the impact that you perceive being on the sector going forward? Yeah, so I, I, we live in a, in a world where we've delivered decision-making uh, artificial intelligence into the finance industry. There is a beautiful and exciting journey with that, which is how humans interact with machine intelligence. We have to, as a company, try and solve into that, because if we don't, we don't get contracts and we don't get paid. Um, so it's very pragmatic. But we've got to remember that the first interaction that humans have with artificial intelligence is usually to reject it um, and to not accept it. I can't buy a black box. It's usually the phrase that repeats and repeats. So when you start to bring in things like chat GPT, a very big cautionary measure, I think this is going to go through a big hype cycle first in terms of uh, very excited for it for the next year or so. But there's one key thing in the middle of it is that, uh, and, and it's really a change in the way that humans interact with artificial intelligence, 
is we believe text. We don't believe numbers because we want to know why the numbers are the numbers. And we want to know why the black box is a black box. But when the black box is talking to you, giving you text, you believe it. And in there, there is a moral hazard because it could be wrong. You're believing something that could be wrong. That could be in the hype cycle that we go into. But what we did as a company is we, and what changed the dynamic for us was textualizing artificial intelligence uh, because then people believed, people adopted, and then machines and artificial intelligence started working together. So new technologies like ChatGPT are, for me, something where you're starting to see fundamental and structural ways that artificial intelligence and humans start acting together and working together. Thank you, Luke. And um, really, well, one of the bigger questions is, you know, we have Engine in the UK. We have an initiative to, to help promote and stimulate innovation within investment management. But how do you think initiatives such as that can help fintech globally? And what should we be doing more on the global stage? So I'll be really, again, trying to be really pragmatic to the point. And that is that with all of the support and all of the structures that are put in place and all of the really good work that agrees those structures, the incubators, the funding, the policy, when it comes down to a founder and a company, it's all about really getting cash flow and getting deals done um, and getting real dollar, pound, yen support uh, for the companies because uh, that makes it really real. Um, and so for me, it's a case of being very pragmatic through things like incubators, um, through funding programs to get to the client, to get to the problem and work quickly to see if we can solve it. And if not, we go to a different problem or a different client, but that's where the real work happens. Um, and so the more we can get closer to client, the more we can get closer to problem, uh, the more we can then make money as a company and survive and grow and invent new things but also de deliver real value into the innovation of the say, asset management. Thank you, Luke. And, you know, we, we sort of all understand that true success is where there is a real use case. First, identify the problem and then seek out the solution. Where do you see um, the major growth area in fintech as a whole as we move into 23 and, and, and beyond? Um, I can only really speak within the domain that I work in. So I work in obviously capital markets and we work in risk. So I, I'll be quite narrow with the response to it. Is really simple. There's too much risk out there and there's not enough people looking at it. Um, and, um, and that's just heightened and heightened. And so you have to use technology. Uh, when you're going into recessionary pressures, you're going to cut costs. So there's going to be even less people looking. Um, and we create more of a vicious circle where we can create a virtuous circle by the implementation. Thank you very much. And, I d you know, it is, you know, important to spend when in a, in a downturn, particularly in technology, as it is a way to create efficiency and to create competitive advantage. I completely agree. Um, thank you so very much, Luke. Um, it's been incredibly insightful. If anybody does have any specific questions now, we're very happy to answer those. Alternatively, um, I'm sure you can find Luke or myself um, in the break. Um, and technology and investment is so important to our sector within investment management. And, you know, I, I always reiterate it's about the problem, find the solution. And it's about relationships and working together on a global stage to access that very best fintech that we have globally. Thank you very much. This concludes our fireside chat. Thank you very much. Now, as we get to the stage ready for our panel discussion, uh, just a couple of reminders. Firstly, to our panelists, uh, please remember to hold the microphones close to your mouth so that we can hear you uh, and so that everyone watching online can hear you as well. Um, you don't need to press the buttons. Everything is being controlled by our sound engineers over there. Also, for everyone in the room, if you see a camera uh, and you need to walk in front of that camera, we are streaming live to an online audience. So if you walk in front of the camera, the online audience will have a lovely view of your head. Uh, please try to avoid walking in front of the cameras. 
or duck if necessary. Now I think we are just about ready to begin our panel discussion on the theme of expansion of foreign financial firms into Tokyo. Let me introduce our panelists and moderator for this session. We have Laurent Depus, Fin City Tokyo Ambassador. Paolo Fidele, Director of Business Development at Tractable Limited. Hugh de Lusignan, Head of Financial Services at the Devo Department for International Trade. And our moderator for this session is Masahide Sakishige, Deputy Director of Jetro London. Please welcome them to the stage. Over to you, Mr. Sakishige. Well, thank you for your kind introduction. And good morning, everybody. I'm Masahide Sakishige, Deputy Director General of the Japan External Trade Organization, the London office, and I will be moderating our next panel discussion. JETRO is a Japanese government related organization that supports trade and investment between Japan and the rest of the world by 50 domestic and 76 overseas offices. In London, we have a number of teams. I lead up the investment innovation team that supports innovative startups and SMEs in the UK, expand to Japan and partnership with Japanese corporates. I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate this panel and I'm looking forward to hearing our expert panelists insights into expanding to Tokyo for financial firms and individuals. And to kick off, I'd like to introduce today's um, panelists and ask them to say a few words about themselves. And firstly, Mr. Roland Dupes. And currently, Roland is a director of the board at SMBC Trust Bank and ambassador for FinCity Tokyo, promoting Tokyo's advantages as an international financial center. Over to you, Roland. Thank you, and thank you for having us today. My name is Laurent de Puce. I sound French, but I always start with that. I'm not from France, I'm from Belgium. And I insist on that, <laughs> it's a big difference. Um, I have been in Japan for about 35 years, uh, joining there in 1988 at the peak of the uh, bubble. And I've been involved in financial services uh, throughout my career uh, in uh, American banks, uh, French banks, and uh, Japanese banks. I'm currently a director and I was the chairman of a company called SMBC Trust Bank. And I'm here today as a FinCity ambassador because it's time to give back a little bit to the country that gave me so much. Thank you, Laurent. And following on, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paolo Fedele. Paolo is Director of Business Development of Tractable, that is a UK AI insurance, insurance startup founded in 2014. And they started the Tokyo operation in 2019. Over to you, Paolo. Thank you, and thank you so much for the wonderful event. I sound Italian, and I am actually Italian. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, I'm basically a business development director at Tractable. Uh, we are a startup now, not so much. We're a scale-up. We actually became a unicorn. Uh, we were unicorn number 100, uh, actually, uh, which was nice because we received a nice letter from the prime minister that we have in our office, uh, and really instrumental to our success. And we'll tell you a bit more about what we do was the entry into Japan. Japan was a market that was ripe for distraction and uh, we were very successful in entering that market uh, with the leading insurance companies uh, in Tokyo. Thank you, Paolo. Last but not least, representing the UK side, we have Mr. Hugh De Lunsion. Hugh is the head of financial, uh, UK financial services at UK Department for International Trade. Over to you, Hugh. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Masahide, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Hugh de Lusignon, and I have a French name, but I have a hope of an English accent. I am English. Uh, that's just there to confuse everybody. Um, as, uh, as Masahide said, I'm the Head of Financial Services for the Department for International Trade. I just want to emphasize a couple of things. We're 
for international trade because we really believe in international trade and it, the fact that it enriches ourselves and the people that we trade with. Uh, and also with the Department for International Trade and Investment. We believe investment and trade go absolutely hand in hand. So um, really pleased to be here. My background uh, before becoming a civil service was working uh, in financial services and indeed, I worked in Tokyo in the 1980s in the bubble economy as a uh, stockbroker uh, trading Japanese equities. Uh, so I'm really, really always very delighted to increase the trade between our two countries. Thank you very much, Hugh. Right. Without any further delay, uh, let's get into the discussion. Today's theme is expansion of foreign financial firms into Tokyo. More specifically, for our audience, I think that the key question, to, key question to ask is, among various potential locations, why Tokyo? I'd like to ask each of our panelists to discuss their individual understanding of Tokyo's position and role as a global financial center from three key standpoints. Change, opportunity, and challenges. By doing so, I hope to make the answer to the question of why Tokyo clearer. First, let us consider change. The Global Financial City Tokyo Vision's first version was created in November 2017. And as Lolo Mayer mentioned, and in December of the same year, a memorandum of understanding was signed by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government and the City of London. In the past, Two Tokyo London financial seminars were held here in 2018 and 2020. And these seminars have contributed towards the realization of this goal. However, in the interim, significant changes have come to the global financial environment. And as a global financial center, Tokyo is stepping up to ensure its place, as Governor Koike explained. Accordingly, in November 2021, version 2.0 of the Global Financial City Tokyo Vision was announced. Based on this background, I'd like to ask, what change have these initiatives realized in the business environment in Tokyo for, finance, uh, for foreign financial firms? And first, as the ambassador for, ambassador for FinCity Tokyo, I'd like to pose this question to Luan. Thank you. Um, so I, I think Ambassador Madden or ex-Ambassador Madden spoke about the acceleration of change. This is uh, something I should maybe take you back. But as, as I said, I joined in 1988. It was the peak of the uh, economic bubble in Tokyo. It was not free for all, but very little regulation. And then the FSA was uh, established in 1998. And we initially called it the financial, not the financial services agency. We called it the financial sanction agency. And uh, it was very difficult to operate. There were all sorts of multiple reportings, various regulators and, and all that. And then gradually through the years, but slowly at the beginning, things started to improve. Now, I move forward in time. 2017, when Governor Koike uh, came, something new happened. It was, uh, first of all, a vision for Tokyo that was established, possibly not entirely defined, but also a big new thing was that there was a common voice that started taking place between the various regulators, between the local government, the central government, it became much easier. Meanwhile, the FSA itself had changed in, uh, tremendously in attitude, so we were talking about a dialogue. It was a lot of listening and mutual benefit uh, for the financial industry and, uh, and the regulators. 2021 is when Vision 2 has been established, and for me that's, uh, that's the latest and large change. You've heard several uh, of the presenters mention clear targets. Now, it's, it's not let's be a global financial center. It's let's focus on these three pillars, green, fintech and digitalization, green and transition and, uh, and uh, renewable energies and everything that's linked to it, digitalization and asset management. Asset management, it's obvious, it's because it's been mentioned, Japan sits on a huge amount of unused unused cash, 2,000 trillion yen. Not quite sure what the exchange rate is with sterling right now, but I, I think in uh, about 15 to 17 trillion US dollars. Most of which, more than half of which, are sitting in cash deposits and uh, 
and uh, uh, liquid uh, ponds. It sits there. And Japanese are not very uh, apt at, in, at taking risk, and they feel that uh, sticking this into uh, their account and sitting on it will not be a risk. Now, there's an education part that promotes investment, and the pillar on asset investment, uh, asset management, is designed to uh, to promote this by inviting additional expertise uh, in asset management. Now, each the change, each of these pillars is not only well-defined, but also very concrete. Each of the pillars comes with a set of uh, subsidy programs and facilities. I don't know if we could see a slide that uh, uh, the TMG prepared at this moment. If you bear with me. Uh, I'll just highlight, you know, we heard from the FSA about the Financial Market Entry Office, which helps purely financial companies, asset managers, to come to Tokyo, set up shop and operate. Tokyo, uh, it's the next page. Uh, Tokyo has a set of uh, subsidy programs that are well defined and apply not only to all companies. There's a system called TOSBEC, Tokyo One Stop Business Establishment Center, where companies can go and establish their company regardless of their business. Uh, it's for all companies uh, in English, which seems obvious here, but not at all in Japan. And then if you satisfy the criteria of the other pillars, whether you are in asset management or in, uh, in uh, digital, fintech, uh, uh, or green transformation, then there's a, an array of uh, uh, subsidies that will operate. I can talk at length about it, but, uh, but I won't. So. Okay, thank you. And clearly, the talk has listened and they made a significant changes. Despite the background of drastic global changes such as COVID-19 and the conflict in Ukraine, Tokyo, we are seeing a positive change towards a more accommodating business environment for foreign financial companies. Okay, in line with this, I'd like to ask Paolo about Tractable's experience as a company expanding to Tokyo from the 2K. Yeah, absolutely. So we are a London-based company that was actually founded by researchers at Imperial College London and, and Cambridge and actually our headquarters are just down the road in, in Liverpool Street and in 2019 uh, through a partnership with Tokyo Marine uh, we expanded into the Japanese market uh, and our experience has been really overwhelmingly positive in the sense that we were able to set out uh, a local entity in Tokyo uh, in Marunochi to be precise, uh, um, and we were also able to attract talent uh, that really was world class. Uh, and so Tokyo became our APAC hub from which we really do business uh, for the entirety of Asia. And just to give you a specific example about, I think, the Tokyo, Tokyo Metropolitan government and, and the pillars, the three pillars that we talked about, the GDP pillars. On the digitalization side, that's really where we benefited the most. And for example, in 2021, we actually won, we were awarded, uh, um, you know, in the financial innovation category, we were awarded an award for the most innovative fintech company. Uh, and this was great for us because us being an AI company, that's very focused on the vertical of supporting basically people recover faster from accidents and, and natural disasters. It was really great to receive a boost of credibility from the Tokyo government. And of all of the places in the world in which we're now present, I would say the Tokyo government is probably among you know, the most visionary and supportive for businesses of startups like ourselves. Thank you, Paolo. Next up, let's get an outside perspective, Hugh. In a position promoting UK financial services abroad, what change have you seen regarding Tokyo as a destination of expansion? And where does Tokyo stand amid, cha um, amid changes in other Asian global financial centers like Hong Kong and Singapore? Yeah, thank you for that. As, uh, as somebody who spends my life promoting financial services, it's always really important to get a balance between policy change and how you promote yourself as a financial centre. Uh, and Tokyo has been doing quite a lot to get ready in terms of its policy changes. And those policy changes can be 
quite kind of technical the way that you're taxed if you're a kind of venture capital company and you can come to international standards. There are also lots of very important soft things. Now, young people these days, they don't just work, you know, they've, they've got partners. They have dual careers, I believe it's called. So if one of them's going to go to Tokyo, they need to be able to accommodate uh, their partner and opening up um, rules on immigration so that partners can, can get full-time employment. These things are really, really important as well. So it's a whole gamut that goes across things like regulation, things like being able to put your forms in in English uh, and take away some of those obscure barriers that are in front of people, but also making it clear that you're an open and dynamic place. Uh, and we were talking about things like uh, fintech. In the UK, 47% of people who work in fintech in the UK are born outside the UK. It's an incredibly international business and you need to be really, really open. Uh, and then we need, you know, we, but Tokyo needs to project that through. Uh, and I think obviously it's succeeding in doing that, um, but there's obviously a long way to go. Sometimes it's perceived to be expensive or difficult. Uh, and these are things that you go, you work your promotion through uh, what the policy changes are. You asked about the competing financial centers, and of course, they're very kind of different. You know, they're Hong Kong uh, uh, and Singapore both came out of a relationship with this country that was very, very close. Um, uh, the development of financial markets that, that they had alongside a legal system gave to a unique entrepreneur, entrepreneur um, uh, experience and, uh, and culture. Uh, and it's developing that and taking advantage of that, I think, is a good thing to look at. Um, the uh, Singaporeans have been really uh, fallout from uh, Hong Kong, uh, as, as Ambassador explained earlier. I think that has been incredibly important. Also, the way regulation is done in Singapore is important because what you've got there is MAS, monetary authority, so uh, the regulator and the promoter at the same time. All right. Holding it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. I was holding the wrong end of the stick. Um, but uh, so I hope I, I hope that was you heard most of what I said. Thank you very much, Hugh. Okay, so so we can confirm this is a huge positive change of Tokyo. All right, uh, move on. I'd like to ask what opportunity Tokyo represents for foreign financial firms. Go on. As a European who has been active in the Japanese financial firm uh, financial spheres for many years, what, in your opinion, is the attractiveness? of Japan, and more specifically, Tokyo. What's the opportunity? That's a long question. Um, <laughs> there's outside opportunities, and, and, and a lot of them have been already mentioned, but there's you know, geopolitics, there's, a, there's a, the opportunities that are presented by outside or outside factors. For example, right now, the weakness of the yen, so the domestic currency, but it's influenced by the, uh, by the rest of the world. It presents opportunities, presents challenges as well, but it's, it's from outside. Then from inside, of course, there's all the things that have been mentioned already. This huge amount of uh, uh, available capital for investment. This is something that very few centers have in that size. There's a rule of law that has been mentioned several times. Tokyo is, I mean, Japan is stable. It's predictable. Predictability, I think, is extremely important. We've seen through the last couple of years that uh, some jurisdictions were extremely less predictable than, uh, than some others. And... Uh, Japan has been extremely predictable. Freedom, uh, physical freedom, but economic freedom is, is, is also there. There's all sorts of uh, criteria, of course, the market, the maturity of the market, the maturity and the size of the industrial uh, 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 ecosystem in Japan, the stock exchange size, 3,800 listed companies, it's, it's, it's all large. So all these things are, are there, and I think they are well advertised. What may be less advertised is the soft uh, attraction of Japan. And I think, again, the, the recent years make it quite, uh, quite good. A large 
for companies that come to Japan and when they send their expatriates to Japan, the people working there, um, they're busy during the day. Their families may not be busy. If one of the main causes of failed expatriation is when the families are not happy. It is very, very rare to find unhappy families in Tokyo because the infrastructure is there. There's nature, there's art, there is sport. There's, there's an infrastructure that works. There's no strikes. Uh, you know, sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very comfortable. So if your family is happy, you are going to be happy, not only because the market is there and the potential of the market and the potential of making money is there, but also because your family is happy. You, you mentioned cost. Brief word on that. Cost is not as expensive as uh, people think. Japan is actually quite cheap. People will focus on some issues, for example, tax, yes, but tax is very high compared to other jurisdictions. There's no way Japan is going to compete with some other centers on tax itself. The entire package will make Tokyo much more attractive overall. Thank you very much. As a Japanese expatriate in London, I fully agree with uh, your opinion about actually family matters. Actually, um, so my family also very, have a very happy life here as well. <laughs> And next, Paolo, and your company has relatively recently started doing business in Tokyo. How did you see the opportunity and advantages prior to starting operation in Tokyo? And then, could you tell us if these expectations were met? It would be fascinating to hear your perspective about someone with real experience of expanding to Tokyo. Yeah, absolutely. So actually before entering into Japan, we were again a young startup and um, some of our investors actually cautioned us against going into Japan so early because it can be a market that can be tough to navigate. Um, but, you know, we went anyways, you know, trusting uh, sort of our guts. Uh, and I think that our expectation uh, sort of the results completely blew our expectations and particularly with regards to two uh, items. I think one is the size of the price and two is the opportunities for improving the product. So in terms of size of the price, uh, I think that particularly for us focusing on insurance companies, uh, there are dynamics in the Japanese market uh, that make it very attractive for startups to enter into the market. So for example, there's basically four players uh, that really dominate uh, uh, the market and they are incredibly competitive. Uh, and so if you start working with one of them, in our case, it was Tokyo Marine, uh, it then becomes a lot easier to expand to the rest of the market. And then of course, you're looking at, you know, the second largest developed market in the world. And so our experience was that, you know, for us going into Japan was really instrumental uh, into us becoming a tech unicorn. Like the sort of revenue growth that we saw out of Japan was just phenomenal. And then I think the second one is that, uh, you know, as we all know, there are a few dynamics at play in Japan that make it very attractive. One is, you know, to some extent, uh, a special and idiosyncratic market. So for example, there is, you know, problem with the aging population and there is lots of natural disasters. So for us, uh, it was perfect ground uh, to partner with insurance companies and develop our products. And then second, as we all know, Japanese are very, you know, demanding clients and, you know, their attention to details is phenomenal. And I think that for us, you know, winning in Japan made us much stronger for the next phase of growth. So if you can make it in Japan, you can sort of make it everywhere. And I think this was like very important for, for us. Thank you very much. So I uh, very uh, know that your company will fit for Japan. Thank you, Paolo. Okay, let's follow up with the UK side again. Um, I've heard that next month, the DIT will lead the UK asset management mission to Japan. Q, perhaps could you tell us more, a little bit more about this mission and how you see the unique opportunities that Tokyo presents for UK asset managers? Thank you, and hopefully I won't put my hand in the wrong part of the uh, microphone. The, um, so yes, we are. We're going out on the 15th of March. It's not just DIT, it's DIT 
and the City of London and the Investment Association all doing it together. We, uh, I really want to emphasize we don't just do things by ourselves, we try to do it with all of our colleagues and, and we're really, really keen to do that and we hope to collaborate on those things. Uh, why are we doing it? We're doing it because we think we've got the best international fund management business in the world based in the UK. As um, the Lord Mayor said earlier, something like 15, 17% of global institutional assets are run out of the UK. Not all in London, uh, but out of the UK. And that's a phenomenal record. Uh, and the institutional money and savings is only going to grow as middle classes grow around the world. And, and as was pointed out, those people who've been sitting on huge pots of cash realizes with the ch challenges ahead that they've got to invest those in real assets uh, in, in the technology that will help the world transition to a clean future. So we think we've got a great message to sell to Japan. We think there's a great market in Japan and we want to collaborate on doing that. And uh, I know times are sort of coming up, but we're really, really, really keen to spread that message that a lot of the investments and investment techniques and the way that we look at it in the UK are unique. And we've always had that global vision. Uh, and we want to share that with our, our, our Japanese uh, our friends and collaborate on that. Uh, and I also want to emphasize, uh, we in the department don't just support UK companies, we support any company that's here. We support Japanese companies here when you're here just as much as we'll support UK companies, just, just to emphasize that point. Thank you very much, Hugh. And for a third topic, so oh, I'd like to talk about challenges. In particular, things one should look up for when expanding to Japan or more specifically Tokyo. Uh, regarding that, so let's hear from, uh, Paolo, sorry. Uh, let's hear from you first. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that uh, Probably the two that come to mind are, you know, one is that, you know, the way of doing business in Japan is different. Uh, and so it takes some adjustment. Uh, um, and this goes from like the smaller things. So for example, today we were exchanging business cards and I didn't have my business cards. And so I felt like a bit dumb. Uh, all the way to, I think, this idea that, you know, in Japan, trust and relationship are very important uh, and so it's very important to work on that. Uh, I think it is important when you go into Japan uh, to set out a local entity in Japan and start hiring some Japanese uh, that can help you navigate the Japanese business way of doing things. Uh, and then I think second, uh, to some extent uh, when you enter into Japan you might notice uh, some resistance to change uh, and so it's important that you don't give up. Because once you cross that hurdle, uh, I think the Japanese clients tend to be lifelong partners uh, that are going to be very loyal. Um, and it is great to see, you know, from the governor, um, you know, all of the initiatives that are trying to, like, you know, improve the digitalization. Uh, and I think they're really going in the right direction when it comes to, like, you know, moving change faster. Thank you very much. Don't give up. Okay, Lauren, so having been in Japan for quite some time, and you have a deep insight into the market, I think. What do you think are the key points for European or UK companies to succeed in the financial market, uh, financial business or asset management business in Japan? It's not only about having your business cards. So <laughs> you, you'll be fine without business cards, although it's useful to have them. Um, but you've, you've pointed out some important points. Uh, reliability, trust, relationship because uh, Japan is based on, on the customer, because the customer is the ultimate focus. So um, a company going there needs, first of all, to demonstrate their reliability and their established trust. This takes time. I think Ambassador Madan, you pointed that out as well. It takes time, so you need some patience. You need to show that you're reliable and you need not to overpromise. because Whatever you, you announce you will deliver, you must deliver it. Uh, you talked about uh, resistance to change. I think this is also because Japan is process-minded. So a lot of the time, it's not that it's resistant to change, but it's a little bit prisoner of its process. That's why the government now is promoting startups and innovation and things like this. 
and there are some success stories, and success stories will keep will keep uh, growing this. I talked a bit about you know in terms of challenges, costs of establishing yourself. Frankly, this is this is a legend. If you calculate and it's demonstrably proven, Japan will be cheaper and more adapted to uh, cost-wise than other jurisdiction uh, in Asia. I think one of the issues is English, uh, and there the public sector is doing a lot. Uh, as we've heard, you know the, uh, the FSA provides a system, uh, Tokyo provides a system for other companies, uh, but gradually companies can file their reporting in English, so English becomes more uh, available, particularly in the public sector. The, 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 the private sector needs to catch up, but, but it does. I mentioned uh, my, my job is with a bank called SMBC Trust Bank. We do provide services fully in English a full range of banking services at individual level. So English is uh, seeping in, but if I had to name one challenge more than any other, it's not about the regulation, it's not about the tax, it's about maybe language. Thank you very much. Yeah, no one. So finally, so here again, so because of time question, I have to be quick a little bit. <laughs> um, so I'd like to know the perspective from the outside of Japan again. Um, so we have learned the key things for following financial company success in Japan, of course, and the power of Lauren's comment, but Tokyo also has to, may, has to adopt itself to the, this global standard and trends for its success. How do you think, can Tokyo best adapt into itself to these trends? Well, I think we heard from um, the governor that actually Japan and Tokyo as a city itself have got plans being put in place to go through the green transition. And I think putting yourself at the forefront of that is incredibly important. And of course, Japan has that um, um, issue that a lot of countries have of being relatively speaking poor in natural resources. It has to import a lot of its, its energy. So it has to think very, very carefully about how it produces energy and becomes self-sufficient and, and supports those supply chains. Uh, we've been doing a huge amount with um, uh, offshore wind expertise and trying to um, work out what works in that, and it might well be floating uh, technology working, and lots of Japanese companies and investors, financial investors, have been very involved in what we've been doing in, in offshore wind. I think there's a lot to think about, you know, the hydrogen economy and how that moves ahead as well. So, um, and that's very much part of the way that investment is moving. Uh, and we all, face, these are common issues for all of us, uh, alongside, you know, lots of other supply chain issues as well. So, uh, you know, I think that common ground of how, how we look at adaptation, uh, how we build in resilience, we haven't really talked about resilience, but resilience alongside adaptation is incredibly important. Thank you very much, Hugh. Okay, now this closes our panel discussion. I'm sure that there are many thought-provoking points and the useful information for participating British company and considering expansion into Tokyo, or more broadly, Japan. In order to maximize the time for our panelists to discuss their own views, we didn't arrange the Q&A session within our panel discussion, but we hope that you will be able to ask questions of the speakers during the networking time after the session. Once again, thank you to our fantastic panelists, Rowan, Paolo, and Hugh for joining us. Thank you very much. And that concludes our panel discussion. Thank you, Mr. Sakishige. Can we have one more warm round of applause for our panelists and all of our speakers so far? Again, we just need a moment to prepare the stage, so please bear with us.
And now I would like to invite Alastair King DL, Alderman and Sheriff of the City of London, to the stage for some closing remarks. Lord Mayor, Governor, um, Your Excellency, so ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is Alastair King. I'm the, uh, uh, currently the Sheriff of London and uh, I work very closely with um, the Lord Mayor in uh, most of his activities. Um, I've been uh, really struck by today's activities uh, in the uh, conference today. I think it's gone extremely well and um, I've certainly learned an immense amount. Uh, some of those points perhaps I just uh, bring up. One is the extraordinary similarity and complementary nature of our of the both the british and japanese economies but also the economies of uh, tokyo and uh, of london and um, those have been highlighted throughout our discussions during the course of the day today which has been very gratifying particularly in the speeches of uh, the lord mayor and of the governor so thank you very much indeed for those um, i'm also uh, really um sort of uh, struck by the uh, the, the priorities that have been brought out, uh, the priorities uh, particularly in, in banking, asset management um, and insurance, uh, plus also the uh, traditional investment areas and the green investment areas, the, uh, uh, the elements of the um, uh, environmental, social and governance elements. And that's been sort of quite noteworthy, plus also fintech and um, you know, the new uh, green finance areas. So it's uh, extraordinary how similar things are and that gives a lovely basis and uh, a foundation for uh, cooperation, which I hope I uh, will be promoting during the course of the day today. I, I would like just to say a few thank yous just as we uh, conclude this part of the, uh, the event. Um, I'd like to say thank you uh, to all those who took part uh, today. I'm particularly grateful to the Governor uh, for her, her keynote address. Thank you, Governor. Um, I'd like also to thank uh, uh, you, Paul Madden, and also uh, um, Kideki Takada. So thank you very much indeed for your addresses as well. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Luke Waddington and Gillian Painter uh, for their discussions in relation to, to fintech and for an excellent uh, panel discussion. So thank you for those. And I'm particularly keen uh, that uh, we, um, uh, we are able to project uh, the similarities between London and Tokyo. Um, as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, there is so much opportunity for the two countries and the two cities to form closer bonds. Um, th we've seen that uh, throughout our civic life and I, I believe when it comes to business, uh, we are similarly, uh, similarly minded. One of the City of London's great strengths, as evidenced here today, is that of being a soft power convener. We're able to bring people together, and um, I think this is a very good example of doing exact, exactly that. Um, that concludes the, um, uh, the formal part of the proceedings today. Uh, we are um, sort of delighted to, uh, to, to welcome you here um, into the networking session, which will uh, um, uh, shortly. Um, I think that uh, you know, we're, for all those watching online, we're very grateful to you for joining in today. We're delighted to have you all online. And for all those here, thank you very much indeed for your time uh, and for your uh, participation and your energy. And arigato. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we've heard, this concludes all sessions of the Tokyo London Financial Seminar 2023. Thank you all very much indeed for spending this time with us today. We hope that all attendees will take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's seminar for guests here at the venue, as well as those joining online. An email link will be sent with the post-event survey to the address you provided at registration. At this point, I would like to ask the Lord Mayor and Governor Koike to make their way to the Salon in preparation for our networking event. For everyone online, thank you once again, and you are now free to exit the seminar. And for everyone else, please feel free to follow the Lord Mayor and Governor Koeke through to the Salon, where the networking event will commence shortly.
Thank you very much.